welcome to the community room here at the Needham Free Public Library for tonight's presentation. So Matt Robinson is our local television personality for the Writer's Block on the Needham Channel, and he has written a book, and he's going to tell you all about the process of what it took to get that book into print and what you need to know when you're writing. So without further ado, Matt Robinson. Thank you, everybody. Hi, uh, Matt Robinson. Uh, I've been in Needham for about eight years, and I've, as we'll get to, I've been a writer for about almost 30. Um, and um, so, you know, we're going to talk about my book, a little bit about my writing career. Uh, if you want to talk about the Ivy League, we can get to that. But basically, first of all, I want to start by, of course, thanking our sponsors, the Foundation, the Needham Channel, and you know, in a little bit of self-aggrandizement, The Writer's Block, which is the show that I produce with, with Mike, uh, where we talk with other writers, including Tom. Linda, we got to get you on soon. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great show. I think on the Needham channel, we've, we've had some really interesting conversations. And we're always looking for uh, more authors. If you know any, please let me know. And we'll take it from there. So um, my path to publication. This is the book that I published about three years ago. It's called Lions, Tigers, and Bulldogs. People say, why didn't you do Lions, Tigers, and Bears? I say, because MGM is a multi-billion dollar entity, and I'm not. Um, so I had enough issue with, uh, with copyright, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, dealing with, with these entities. Um, it was, frankly, much more complicated than I thought it would be, but uh, we, can, we can talk about, talk about that later. So my main, my main premise is that everyone has a story. I've also been a writing teacher for about 25 years. Uh, and my goal in that capacity is really to encourage my students to develop their communicative confidence. So many students these days have been told they're not good writers, feel they're not good writers, and uh, you know, have, been, have been very discouraged. And um, you know, as difficult as the process to uh, put this book together was, um, you know, it, 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 it really taught me a lot of uh, a lot of values and lessons that hopefully I'll be able to share to share with you. But so that's kind of my my basic premise. And so the key is to have the motivation to tell that story. Um, as as we'll discover, my motivation was was not so positive. It was kind of a, a difficult situation that that led me to uh, to do this book, but it has been really rewarding. So by way of introduction, like I said, more than 25 years of writing and editing experience published a few thousand pieces all over the world, still freelancing, but it's not what it used to be. Um, I was with The Globe for a while on, with Billboard magazine. I started as a music critic. Now, I, uh, you may have heard me on WBZ. I talk about food with Jordan Rich. I have the writer's block. You know, kind of always on the hustle, working from home before it was hip. You know, so that's just uh, kind of been what it was. Um, as I said, been te teaching writing for a long time. Uh, from preschool all the way up to college. I'm currently teaching at the Norfolk, Sheriff's, uh, Norfolk County Sheriff's Office, the prison in Dedham, which has been a really uh, interesting and, and rewarding experience and with very engaged students, which is a, a rare treat. And uh, in all that time, one book. <laughs> or as I like to say, so far, right? There's that, what they call it, the gro growth mindset. Okay, so here's the story of my story. My father had gone to Brown University in Providence, and I had gone with him to many Brown football games when I was young. But, you know, Ivy League football not being Big Ten, SEC, et cetera, I really fell in love with the mascot, Bruno the Bear. You know, had the big head, no one knew who they were, completely uninhibited, wild and free, and clearly having more fun than the linebackers, so uh, that was it. And it just kind of really stuck with me, um, that, you know, that sort of thing to the point that people in high school said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, the brown bear. Way led on the way, I ended up in Philadelphia, but not in Providence, but um, I still go down a lot. I actually just took my daughters to uh, the brown pen game a couple weeks ago, and you know, still just totally, totally fell back in love with, with the mascot. So I had this idea for a book about the Ivy League for a long time, but mostly about the mascots. Um, that's kind of where it started. But as I'm a freelancer, you know, I make my living working for other people. And so doing something for myself, what you know, might once have been called a vanity project, was really just not on my radar. It just, it, it didn't seem acceptable. It seemed, you know, it, that's where the term came from. It seemed like a vanity project, something too kind of selfish to do. Um, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, 
uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, my father was diagnosed with dementia. And I started to realize that not only did I want to honor him, but as he was an attorney, as someone else who makes their living with their vocabulary, it was, you know, it's, it was time to, time to get this done. Uh, so there were, those were kind of the two uh, main reasons why I allowed myself uh, and encouraged myself to take on this project. So the main lessons that I've learned are do your research, and I'm going to go into more detail about all these later. When in doubt, move on, but, but persevere. Gather your allies, listen to experts, but only so much, and always be the last set of eyes on a project. So as far as doing your research, you really have to make sure your idea or your angle is significantly different from what's in the market. And it's, it's a delicate balance. Many years ago, I went to a writer's conference, pretty significant one, and one of the speakers who was a publisher for one of the, you know, the big houses stood on the stage and basically said that book publishing is kind of like the fashion world and that everything is kind of preordained. She basically said, if you can come out with a book about unicorns and popsicles in 2027, you'll sell a million copies. And, you know, it was kind of discouraging. I really thought a good idea is a good idea and it has its merit. Um, obviously, I still kind of went my own way with it, but uh, even if you are going to follow the trend, I would really recommend having your own flavor of popsicle, as it were. So, you know, in, in, uh, in the youth world, you know, Harry Potter, uh, you know, really became the trend, set the trend, and now, you know, children's fantasy is huge, um, you know, zombie fantasy, you know, there are all these categories that have, you know, really been, been great, but if you're, you have to kind of fit in that realm without being too similar to any other members of it. So it is, it is kind of a, a, de a delicate balance. Another thing is you have to make sure you're submitting your ideas to the appropriate people. Um, some publishing houses are known for doing certain niches, you know, romance, history, etc. But in the bigger houses, and even some of the smaller ones, each publisher, each editor has a different wheelhouse, as it were. And so you need to, you know, a lot of them, their policy is if you send it to one of us, you send it to all of us. So if you don't pick the right, most appropriate person right off the bat, you can really be shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so that's kind of an important thing. I mean, right now, I'm trying to find an agent and a publisher for some other ideas, and it's hours a week just really doing research into, you know, who might be the best fit, because you can't really do a shotgun. It's not like, you know, when I, okay, when I was first a freelancer, I would just, especially when email came on, I would just kind of carbon copy a whole bunch of editors, say, here's an idea who's interested, and occasionally you'd get that 2% return, but it was still enough to sell the assignment. Publishing is a lot more front-end research. You have to know, you know what, I mean, there are these websites now where the, the editors say, these are the things I'm into, this is what I'm looking for, this is, you know, I have three dogs and love ballet, and if you can, you know, try to make that connection even on a personal level, uh, it can really, it can really uh, be, be a benefit. Another way is to make sure that you use their preferred means of communication. Uh, with electronic communication, most publishers want an email. However, some of them want the copy in the email. Some of them want a PDF attached. Some of them want a Word file attached. Some of them have uh, their own submission websites that you have to go to and copy everything into their little boxes which also can take most of the day. Um, and yes, you know, for our paper and pencil folks, uh, some people still like a hard copy in an envelope with something called stamps, which I've been meaning to look into. I heard it's a really new technology. Um, so that, you know, so again, they, they want to know that you're paying attention. They want to know that, that you took the time, that you're not just throwing it out to everyone you can. And so that's, that's kind of a, an important point. So, you know, when in doubt, move on. And, um, I'll, I'll get to my example and how I kind of came to this lesson. You need to trust your gut, whether it's, you know, knowing who to, who to pitch to, uh, knowing, you know, how long to wait. Often they'll tell you, you know, if you don't hear from us within six months, it's a no. Occasionally, I find reasons to kind of follow up. I meet someone who knows them. I say, oh, it's just talking to someone, you know. But it really, you have to be careful because some of these people are very strict with their policies. And if you cross the line, you're done. And you know, even if they liked your stuff, they'll you know 
take offense, as it were, and they just won't even respond. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And if something seems wrong, it probably is too. My story about this is when I was originally coming out with the idea, it was the mascots were kind of the anchor. And I found a publisher who had a series of books where the mascot takes you on a tour of their school. So you'd have the husky takes you on a tour of Northeastern, or the tiger takes you on a tour of LSU. I thought I found the jackpot. It was, you know, I was, this is perfect. We were talking about doing a whole series of the smaller, you know, the smaller schools, the Ivy League, the Patriot League, the Seven Sisters. It was, you know, going to be just blue skies all the way ahead. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, um, I took some pictures right off the school's websites and emailed them, laid out very vaguely, and, I, and the email said placeholders, and the beginning of the email was, Please understand, these are placeholders. I do not have the rights to use these pieces. They are just meant to show you that I want the mascot here, the building there, you know, the text here and here, and let's, let's go on from here. Two days later, I received an email, first draft. I will demonstrate. This was what I sent to the publisher, and this is what they sent back. This is what I sent to the publisher, and this is what they sent back. Can you spot the difference? I can't. So I contacted the publisher, and I said, look, uh, I don't know if you've n realized this, but these are eight, as I said, billion dollar corporations. And I looked at my contract. There were no protections. The publisher said, don't worry, Matt, we'll be fine. Uh -huh. I said, I'm taking my text back and my rights back. Thank you very much. Now, I've never been late in all of my thousands of assignments with an assignment, and I'm very proud of that fact. I had given myself an assignment for this book of what would have been my father's 80th birthday. He you know, had subsequently passed in the meantime. So by the time I had gone through this traditional publishing route, I was down to months to make that. And I still had no book. I now had no, I had no illustrator. I had no printer. So it was a bit of a rush. Luckily, I was able to find, uh, find Jim Rolden, who was an art teacher in Maine. Uh, he was like basically the first person that I was referred to. And he just got it right off the bat. He did first draft, but with his actual drawings that were, as you'll see in the book, were, were significantly different. Um, it still took a long time to get the permissions from the schools. In fact, I still don't have it from one of them, but there's a huge disclaimer on the title page. Um, what I didn't realize is I thought, I mean, the Ivy League is an entity that has their office on the Princeton campus. Strangely enough, Princeton didn't, you know, didn't really know. The, P the Princeton administration didn't have direct ties. And then I also found out that for every sports team, there were different licensing organizations. I contacted the NCAA. I contacted the Ivy League, but then there were all these third-party contracted um, part, you know, organizations for the football team, for the basketball team, for the women's field hockey team, et cetera. So it was a lot of phone calls, a lot of letters, a lot of trying to play them against it. You know, oh, this school said yes, how about you? Sending them, sending the copies, uh, the, you know, the, the, the um, rushes of the book to the school presidents, to the provosts, to the chancellors, just saying, this is a promotional piece. I mean well, you know, I love these schools. My wife went to Dartmouth, my father went to Brown, my mother-in-law went to Columbia. Not to, not to brag, but this is kind of was part of my life. And the point of this book was, yes, to honor my father, but also to kind of, you know, these schools are not, don't have the athletic attention. They don't have these books about the LSU Tiger or the USC Trojan. You know, they're, the, the people know these schools, of course, but in a different way. Um, you know, I was very careful to have the same number of images on each spread, the same number of facts on each spread, and one or two that were kind of a little poke in the ribs, but most of them that were very respectful and positive. You know, for example, um, the chicken nugget was developed by Professor Cornell, who is now a member of the Poultry Hall of Fame. <laughs> or the Science Center at Brown is not only the tallest building in Providence, but it is, well, highest building in Providence, it's up, it's up on Federal Hill. Um, it has 12 floors, the stairwell to which is color-coded to the pH scale. Things, things like that, you know, the bell tower 
at Dartmouth, you can make requests and it'll play Happy Birthday, Gilligan's Island, the Jeopardy theme, et cetera. So, you know, but most of them are, you know, respectful, honorable, positive things. So be that as it may, it took a long time. And so obviously, you know, the next lesson is to persevere. Publishing can be challenging. You hear the stories of success. You know, you hear the J.K. Rowling's, the Stephen King's. Many, many years ago, I don't know if you're familiar with Brad Meltzer. He writes like the adult mysteries and also this amazing set of children's books about famous people in the world. Um, he, I, I interviewed him for the Globe, and he introduced me to his agent, who, when I needed one, I wrote her a letter about two years ago, and she just passed the week before. <laughs> so. There's that thing about you know, going in early. But be that as it may, we were at what was then the Borders Bookstore in Downtown Crossing, which is now Walgreens. We're sitting on the second floor at the little coffee shop, and I'll never forget it. This is like 20, 25 years ago. I just started out as a writer. She wait, this is like the agent's assistant. You know, so, but it was fine. It was something. She waved her arm majestically over the books. She said, what percentage of these books do you think cover their advance? I said, I don't know, what, 80? She said, take the zero off. It's about 8%. She said, at that time, John Grisham, Stephen King are bankrolling the entire publishing industry. So, you know, you hear those stories. You know, you hear James Patterson now has six other writers working for him, but all the books come out under his name, and they're like, book, he's running basically his own book of the month club. You know, we all know who the giants are, but then you also hear that even Rowling pitched to 300 different publishers. And then, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, um, yeah, you know, you hear, you hear these stories of, you know, like the Colonel Sanders, you know, took his 11 herbs and spices to 200 other, you know, and he just, you got to keep going. You never, the next one could be it. And um, so, you know, admittedly, they're the vast minority, but, but they can happen. So my advice is to set a deadline. That really helped, you know, not just having it be this amorphous thing that I'd get around to at some point. You know, as I said, unfortunately, my deadline was not such a positive thing, but you know, it, it did help me get it done. I kind of back scheduled. Okay, I want to have you know the first draft by this time, and this by this time, and that's something I, I also talked to my um, my writing students about. And um, you know, set a budget, consider it a Vegas vacation. You're probably going to lose it all, but at least you'll hopefully have something in your hand when you when you go back home at the end. Um, and you have to remember that it's your book. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to give you their opinion along the way. You know, I tell the same thing to my students. I say, you know, when I'm correcting your paper, if I don't understand what you're going for, we can discuss this, but I'm not going to tell you you're wrong because obviously that's counter to my trying to build their confidence. So, you know, I'll circle things on their paper. I don't use a red pen. You know, it's kind of psychological, but it's what my, my teachers were, were generous enough to do for me. And I say, you know, if I circle something, I don't quite get it. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. I teach a lot of new immigrant students, so there's language issues, et cetera. So, you know, just um, it, it, it re you really have to have a core that, that, you, that you stick to. Um, you know, that being said, no matter what you do, the route is challenging. So, um, oh, there we are, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, the, another important point is the topic needs to interest you, because if it doesn't interest you, it's, you know, you're going to be with it for a while. You know, you're getting married to this thing. So if you can't keep the romance, the romance burning, it's got to be a problem. And, and you know, that'll, that'll show up. We've all read books that you know, were kind of dialed in. So anyway, if you need help, gather your allies. By this I mean you know, pick a few friends and colleagues, a small group. You don't want to have too many cooks, as it were. You want them to be as objective as possible while having your best interests at heart. Again, a delicate balance. And people who don't mind reading draft after draft after draft. If you can find that, things should be OK. So you know, while, putting, while having other eyes on your paper can be helpful, like I said, too many opinions can really get overwhelming. So I really recommend um, keeping that core group. Uh, like I, I kind of made a writer's group with two other writer, English teachers who have published one book each. We check in with each other every two weeks. You know, did you, did you write, write, apply for an agent? Yes. You know, did you do that new draft? Yes. You know, things like that. It's just being accountable in addition to your deadline. So that being said, I also advise to listen to experts, but only so much. My first advice is to seek professional help of one type or another. Sometimes you need the other type. Um, 
editors and publishers can provide useful advice, but again, what matters most is what you want to say. You, you know, you still need to take that core. I mean, with this book, at, at a great oversimplification, I basically had one publisher said, make the cover red, another publisher said, make the cover blue. You know, you, if, if I want it to be striped, I keep it striped. If I want it to be yellow, you know, you have, you have to decide, because it's still a very subject, subjective business. And, you know, if you make too many changes for the one person, if they drop it, then you have to kind of figure out where you started again. Now with computers, it's kind of easier. I had version 1, version 1x, version 1xx, version 1xxx, version 2, et cetera. Um, but that, gets, that can get kind of crazy too. As I tell my students, always be the last set of eyes on anything you write. Uh, there were stories in the Globe and the Journal this week about AI technology and how they actually had an AI written paragraph, which, you know, for a high school paper would probably get by. Um, and it's, it's scary. I mean, being an English teacher, it's really scary. I once had a student plagiarize Wikipedia, but they, and I found the article, but they plagiarized every third line, so it made absolutely no sense. <laughs> and they had a color printer. So their writing was black, and the Wikipedia were in green. And I said, if you had just unified the font and the color, you would have done better. But this is just, you know. And, but my student said, well, Mr. Robinson, it's on the internet, so it's OK. So you know, and the other issue is that there are tools. There's Grammarly. There's spell check. They're just tools, OK? What you want to say you know, is important, but, but um, you know, again, other people can be helpful, but nobody knows what you're trying to say better than you. So one of the things I always put up when I'm teaching my class is this. Okay? Spell check. Wouldn't find it, right? All English, all spelled correctly. But hopefully, this is an intelligent audience. You, you all know better. Okay. So what comes after? What comes after you have the book or sometimes even before. Um, I've noticed that a lot of publishers ask you explicitly, what will you do with this book if we publish it? How will you support us? It's not you know, the old days where you got your advance and you know, they scheduled everything and they did, you know, same with the record industry. They, there's not the big PR push that you used to get. So um, you have to kind of you know, cast a wide net. And I, by that, I mean in terms of your potential audience and also potential promotional opportunities. You know, I mean, I've uh, had the generous gift from the library and the foundation to have this event. I've presented this book at alumni groups, at Staples, at, you know, I mean, just pretty much any, you know, anyone you know who can have any sort of connection, you just got to really beat the bushes. I mean, I'm always asking people at Rotary Clubs. So, you know, things uh, the, I'm scheduled to, to uh, present to the Exchange Club next year. Um, so just, you know, even if you're not sure if there's, if there's a connection, can't hurt to ask. It's the same thing as like, you know, the same training you get from going for the agent or the publisher can really serve you well on the back end. Um, so, you know, be creative, think outside the box, think broadly, and really the most important part, I really think, is to, you know, you have to, not only do you have to uh, really be in love with the idea, but you really need to have fun with it because you are going to probably be with it a long time. And, you know, like I said, you're going to be made to jump through hoops through the whole process. You know, promoting your own book. I mean, I have PR experience, but even with that, it's been, it's been really tough. I've literally, you know, th this book being what it is, it's admittedly niche, but hundreds of thousands of alumni, right? I've literally contacted every alumni group in the entire world for all eight schools. And Zoom was actually great for me. I actually presented in Alaska, Switzerland, Georgia. But it, the, the, you know, frankly, the percent return, as happens, has been kind of frustrating, you know? Because I thought, you know, these are my people. I have this event. It also will hopefully, a lot of people I've presented to have told me that they were inspired to write a book or that they have, a, you know, people send me great stories uh, that they know about the schools. And I'm keeping, I have this huge, like, 100-page file for you know, volume two once I've paid off volume one. Um, so, you know, uh, but that, that's really been the gratifying part. Having events like this, meeting people like you, sharing stories, hopefully maybe giving you some 
despite all this, I know it sounds like a real downer, but hopefully you have some, have some hope. And if you have a story, you know, maybe you'll, you'll consider seeing how far you can get with it. And like, you know, with, with self-publishing and all that, it, it's all possible. It really just depends how much, how much you want to, how much you want to put into it. But I, we all have interesting things. Everyone's life is interesting. You know, being, being a journalist, people ask me, you know, who is your favorite interviews? And, you know, I've interviewed my heroes. I've interviewed celebrities. But I really like telling the stories that haven't been told. I once interviewed a minor celebrity. Well, I won't say interviewed. I reached out to their publicist, and they sent me, they said, these are the questions you will ask, and these are the answers we will provide. Write the story. You know, I mean, it's canned. It really, you know, unfortunately, it really kind of, you know, they're, oh, they're going to ask me about, you know, who inspired me again. And yada, yada. So I've always tried to be a little off the wall. Um, you know, I had a, a column in Metro where I would do the five questions, but the last one was always a little weird. So I interviewed the um, chairman of the Coolidge Corner Theater. You know, what is your favorite movie? You know, the first four were predictable. The last one was Raisinets or Goobers. You know, that, it, they, you, you kind of catch a little different. And so that, you know, being creative, I found to be helpful. Obviously, you need to stay respectful. So those are the lessons I've learned. Thank you all for your attention. And if anyone has questions, comments, et cetera, I will gladly take them if you think of them later. That's how to reach me. So any, any, any uh, questions or thoughts? Oh, yeah, uh, there are my books. If you do have an affiliation to the schools, I'll be happy to give you one of our coloring pages. You can see the one that my daughter did on top. But yeah. Anyway, so any questions or thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Did you do it again? I'm doing it again. What? Yeah, like I said, I mean, you know, um, I have I have plenty of material for a whole library of these things, but you know I am uh, working on other ideas, trying to leverage this into. Even though you're self-published, you're still a published author, and I have sales numbers, and I have the, you know how many people have come to my events, and that I've had them all over the world, and that I have you know I'm in the media, I have media contacts, I have an audience. You know, I mean the book is thank you to the Needham Channel. The book is featured on the show as sort of a sponsor, so that you know that gets it out. Um, Jordan Rich was nice enough to, to uh, do a review for me, which is, you know, gold around here. Um, I've been presenting it, you know. So um, I'm not planning on doing a second one on the Ivy League right yet, though I have tons of material. But I am trying to, you know, other of those back burner ideas, all of a sudden I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe there's something here. Um, you know, I have many more than I could ever do. But, you know, I've, I've sent them around four or five ideas to my partners, as it were, and we've kind of honed in on, you know, these two are probably your best bets. So, um, you know, one of them is an idea that I started working on before this ever was, was anything, and I've, I've returned to it. Um, you know, again, it's been tough, it's been frustrating, it hasn't been what I was hoping or expecting. But, you know, I don't, I've put in so much by this point, you know, I, I don't want it to die in the vine, so keep trying, because why not? You know, you never know. But, yeah, fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find an agent now, and I have been, uh, I have a, a great database of pub some publishers you don't need an agent. Um, so I have been basically doing one agent letter and one publisher letter every week, more or less. You know, my partners are trying to keep me on that schedule. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to, you know, it's still easy to back burner it. But, um, you know, I, I've been trying that route because even though they may not give you as much as they may have in the past in terms of the, the after publishing support and all, um, especially with only a few months, this, this was hard. This was a 20 hour a day job. You know, I mean, I went back and forth with, you know, as, as, uh, as Joan and Gay Ellen can tell you, I'm not really shy about sending a lot of emails to try to figure things out. And I was kind of in a panic mode. You know, I really, even though no one else knew about the deadline, but me, um, if you talk to my illustrator, he'd, you know, he'd probably say that he'd, he'd, he'd have to wonder whether he might work with me again. Um, and again, to the point of, you know, have, your, have you be the last set of eyes, the issue that I say about having your allies and having other readers, and this happens with my students, with everybody, if you read your thing too much, you're going to miss something. You just start, you know, you can't. So unfortunately, in the first run, uh, there was an, uh, an extra T in Princeton. Oops. <laughs> so I had to pull, pull that run back. And uh, actually, it was at a very early pres I didn't notice it. That was a very early presentation. And a friend of mine who had gone to the school went, and of course, he opened right to that spread. He goes, uh, Matt, have you seen this? 
And that was that was the first question at the end of the event, like my second event. I was like, oh. So yeah, I uh, basically put all that that run in in the back in the attic and and started over again. So you know that that's really the main reason why. Be the last set of eyes, but like with my English students, I tell them to read the paper, read the story backwards, read it out loud. But something with the spelling thing, you know, even if you're reading it out loud, you still might miss it. So that's you know, it, it's going to happen. Hopefully, it's not that noticeable. But anyway, Jonathan, do you have a question? There, there are alternatives. Um, when I first started, you know, I, I do a lot of my stories like the food stuff on Jordan Rich. I, I've always been kind of a champion of the independence. I don't like to work with with chains and things of that sort. My my stepfather was in uh, family retail until Mr. Walton came riding in from Arkansas and put an end to that. So um, I, ha I really want to work with the independent bookstores that I try to be, you know, be a customer and make relationships. And a number of them said, if you work with Amazon, we won't work with you. So for about the first two years, I really just went directly to them, consigning, you know, trying to just make personal. It was a lot of work. I mean, I was driving around all over New England. And you know, I, I didn't even get to Cornell. I didn't even get down to Princeton. So you know, it was hard. And I still check in with those independent publishers, especially if I'm going to be near one of them uh, on some sort of other travels. Obviously, with Zoom, that was made a little easier. Um, but eventually, it was just you know, I went back to freelancing, and the traveling was just killing me. So I kind of flipped over to Amazon. Um, you know, it's it's been easy. I mean, the the main thing that it opened up is they have a, a relationship with Barnes and Noble, which is most of the university bookstores are now Barnes and Noble. Um, even with that, though, um, it's been hard to get into those those stores. I mean, it took me two years to get into Penn, and the happy sad is that they're selling it all over the place. It's at the cash register. It's next to, you know, um, the uh, the um, Biography of Benjamin Franklin by, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but anyway, it's all over the store, but after they take their cut and Barnes & Noble takes their cut, et cetera, et cetera, I'm getting like 50 cents a copy, if that. So, you know, it, it's kind of like getting royalties on a, you know, two cents on a, on a song play or whatever. It's nice to get, you know, it's better than nothing, it's, it's getting exposure, but it's kind of a, a, a bittersweet sort of element of, of, uh, of the, way things, the way things go these days. So, you know, ideally for me, Amazon is good, you know, buying them direct is great. Um, you know, people email me, you know, can you inscribe this to my son who just got into Harvard, you know, that I just, you know, throw in the shipping and sign it and send it off and put in some of the coloring pages, et cetera, and try to make a, you know, write them a thank you note, try to make a, you know, make that relationship because th those really have, have come around for me pretty well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the target audience is is staff, students, alumni. Apparently, the book has helped some students get in to the schools because they're able to kind of wow the interviewer with a little factoid that they didn't know. Uh, yeah, I, I did send this to everyone I knew at the schools ahead of time, and a lot of them were like, "Oh my God, I never, I never knew such and such and so and so." So that helped me kind of uh, pick out um, which one to use. Someone, someone actually wrote me and said, "I think this is incorrect," and I sent them my research. You know, in a respectful way, but I said, no, I, I, I checked on this, it's good. Anyway, um, but, you know, occasionally I go to these events, someone might know somebody, but it's just some people just kind of like the stories, they like the format, they said that they have an idea they want to maybe, like I found these books about, you know, the mascot taking you through their school that got me the idea. Apparently some people have been kind of inspired to, you know, it, I mean, you can see the book, it's this, you know, it's, it's all little fun facts. Um, there's not a lot of heft to it, you know, people said, can you put it on an audio book or online? It, it doesn't really feed itself that way because it's not a conti continuous text. Um, so as far as surprises, I mean, the fact that I've been invited to go to retail stores, rotary clubs, exchange clubs, things that aren't, or this, or, you know, this, this event, you know, I thought alumni clubs was gonna be it, but as I said, you have to think broadly. You know, so people here may have affiliations with the school, but not necessarily. So if I'm at an alumni club, I talk more about the schools and about the facts. But this is more, you know, this this is the presentation that's gotten me a little more traction because it is a little, I, it, it, I've been led to understand it's a little more engaging, a little more broadly engaging, which is, which is great, you know. 
I mean, if I, if I can inspire someone to go f write that book that's been on their back burner forever, I don't care if it's about college or what, you know, that's, that's wonderful. That's like having, you know, when a student calls me 10 years later and, and says, you know, I just finished my PhD and thank you for helping me learn how to write. I mean, there's not, you know, it's not lining my pockets, but you know, there's nothing, there's nothing better than stuff like that. So, you know, which is why, why I teach, you know, it's, I mean, as you know, it's not easy, but we got to stay at it. So yeah, so um, I guess just, you know, the surprises have been who, you know, with whom it's resonated. Um, like I get a lot of emails, you know, my grandfather was, you know, in the, the, the Yale boat that won the Olympics and, you know, and this and that and, the other. and you know, to have that feedback and to kind of add to that file, even if it never gets published, you know, people are paying attention and that's, that's really, that's really rewarding. Anyone else? Yes. Um, we had, t we, it was a straight front end and then um, a percentage of the first X number of books. So we kind of did that. Um, so you know, as far as we're we're kind of both both clean right now. Um, yeah, no, I, like I said, I was very lucky. He was very understanding. I mean, he you know he hand did the whole book, the text, everything. So if I found a ty typo, the whole page had to basically be redone again. So he was incredibly patient, understanding, and you know, I I I sing his praises everywhere I can. I've I've referred him to some other to some other writers. Um, you know, so I was very lucky. Um, he's in Maine. Yeah, he's he's an art teacher. He's an art teacher at at, uh, at UMaine, or no, I think. Um, but you know, I just was referred to him. Right, it was I didn't really have to go searching. I had been looking on some of you know like Fiverr and Craigslist, and just to get a rough idea of who was out there. But someone I'd worked with before said, "Hey," I uh, I said, "Yeah, I'm just talking." I, I yeah, the, I told him that the deal had fallen apart and that I need an illustrator. They said, "Call this guy Jim," and you know, he got it, and it was great. So very fortunate in that regard. I mean, you know, uh, with a lot of the big publishing houses, they give you an illustrator, and you just take what they give you. Um, but so I was really lucky to really be able to build a relationship on the front end. What role does Hatchet play for independent bookstores and self-publishing people? What role does? Hatchet. Service. Oh. Um, I'm at, you know, I'm, I've been kind of doing more um, just kind of like direct relationships. I mean, I have, I have Amazon for my world sales, but I'm still really been, you know, I mean, I always have my flyers in my back pocket and whenever I go to a bookstore, I, you know, always introduce myself. You know, I mean, we had that event at Hummingbird Books. That's, you know, it's a lot of door knocking. Sometimes they say, okay, enough already. This isn't going to happen, but you know, nothing ventured. So, uh, you know, uh, as Joan and Gail can tell you, there was a lot of door knocking to get this event, and I'm hope, hope <laughs> yeah, thank you for nodding, and I'm hoping that they, uh, they find it worthwhile. Um, I will definitely be inscribing the whole building. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, so uh, that, yeah, that's just, there, there are so many routes. Um, again, the same way people, there, you know, there's that fork in the road between traditional publishing and self-publishing. It's, it becomes more like a tree. No matter which path you take, there's doors and doors and doors and choices and choices. And it really can get overwhelming. So I just kind of went with, okay, I'm going to do this first on my own with the independent bookstores. And then when that kind of exhausts itself, I'm going to go to the system that most people know these days, even though I'm not such a fan of their business practices, et cetera. Unfortunately, it's, you know, as with any big store, it's kind of unavoidable to a point. Not yet. No, no, I did this one completely on my own. I'm looking now, but like I said, I'm, I'm pitching to the publishers that don't need an agent. But for one of my books, I, it's kind of educational, so I'd like to get like Scholastic or one of those books, uh, you know, companies that have relationships with schools. So that's, you know, but they are, you need an agent, you need to have a referral, and, you know, they know what they have, and they know what their demand is. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of tough, and there have been some that I, wanted to pitch, but I don't really feel ready yet. So I'm kind of waiting to get some feedback from some other publishers. So, you know, you really, I mean, I have this spreadsheet of who I talk to, how long they want me to wait, when I should follow up, and that's, you know, hmm? Yeah, oh, just, well, you know, I mean, it, you really, if you call too soon, it can, you know, if some of them say don't call, literally, you know, if you don't hear, no, tell me okay? If you don't hear from us in six months, it's a no. 
And if you write to one of us, like I said, you've written to all of us, so you know, don't try to end run me by sending one to, my, to the editor next door. If, I, if you don't hear from me, you are not hearing from us, move on. So you, know, it, it, you really have to strategize. And uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, and it's, frust it's, you know, it's frustrating. But you got to stick to it. Oops. No, go ahead, Ben. Not as much freelance work as I'd like, but yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still kind of pitching all the time and trying to make relationships with, you know, whenever I travel, I always call the local newspapers and try to uh, see if I can, you know, it, it really has paid off again, just, you know, you got to try. I mean, one time I was going to Austin on my own, and I called the uh, the star, the, the local paper, and the music editor called me back and said, um, "I'm going to Aretha Franklin the night you get in. Do you want a reviewer for me?" Fifth row and backstage to Aretha Franklin wasn't a bad thing, and and 50 bucks for the story and front page. So you know, occasionally it works. More often it doesn't, but the ones that work, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, yes. When I have when I have an event like this. It, you know, it really, and, you know, unfortunately having my dad's, you know, kind of legacy in the book has, has helped get through those, the tougher things. Al? Yeah? Okay. I was thinking about the challenges you had with the copyright, and has that changed your point of view on copyright, copyright laws? On one hand, you protect artists and writers, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, creativity and the ability to do something. I mean, a copyright as a freelancer has been another thing that I found very delicate because um, when I pitch a story, my, my uncle is an IP attorney and he wrote me a copyright, you know, kind of boilerplate and I put it at the bottom of every pitch. Some editors completely ignore it and tell me they're not interested and then publish the story themselves the next day. Uh, I've had editors get it, tell me that they're insulted. You know, how dare you? Who do you think I am? I would never do this. And then, so that doesn't work. So it's hard. I mean, I usually do a one-line pitch. And if you go to any journalism school, they will say, you need to tell them who your contacts are. You need to tell them why. Same with the book. What are you going to write about? Why you should write it, you know, et cetera. It, it isn't really worth the time. It hasn't been. I don't do long pitches like that. I do one-line pitch. I have this contact. I have this story. Do you want it? I can tell you more. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But when it doesn't, it's easier to swallow because it hasn't been the whole day. So, but you know, I mean, copyright, because it's still so subjective, it's been a real double-edged sword. So, you know, there's, there's no, you know, with all the technology you'd think there'd be, put in, get out, but I, I really haven't found that yet. Anything else?